Tons of oil. There are two anointed ones written in the book of Zechariah that each and every one of you need to know about. <coughs> anointed, as it appears in the English King James Version Bible, is translated from the Hebrew Ben Yitzhar. And it means sons of oil. Why do you need to know about these two sons of oil? They will, and I believe in the very near future, have comforted the elect throughout the tribulation of Antichrist. They will have exhorted the elect throughout the tribulation of Antichrist. These two sons of oil may have even protected the elect during this difficult time. Most importantly, these two sons of oil will provide the elect with an abundant supply of oil, which is symbolic of truth. Before we go to Zechariah, I think it's important that you understand the golden candlesticks and understand the symbology that is involved in the golden candlesticks. So we're going to start there and we'll build a base as we proceed. Let's pick it up with Exodus 25, verse 31, with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's precious name, verse 31. And thou, thou being Moses, shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Now this word candlestick in the Hebrew is a term or a, a, a word that you all are probably fairly familiar with. Menorah. You've heard of the menorah. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. And what this beaten work means is that it's to be made out of one solid piece and then beaten into shape. His shaft, or the center part of the candlestick, if you will, and his branches, which are cups resembling the calyx of a flower, his bowls, which the uh, bowls are, are actually the cups, excuse me, resembling the calyx of the flower, and his knops. Now these knops are actually little spherically shaped knobs, if you will, and his flowers, or ornaments in the form of, of buds just bursting, shall be of the same. Verse 32, and six branches shall come out. And I think it's important to this message to point out six branches. I was trying to think while I was studying for this message, why did God go to this description of the candlestick? And I'm going to bring up a picture of the candlestick here in a moment to show you. But why did he go break it down into six when it, you know, we end up with seven? I think most of you know that. Why did he say six? And then three and three. Six, what is that in biblical numerics? Weakness of man. Okay? And that's important in this message, and that's, we'll get to that in a moment. And then he goes into three branches of the candlestick out of one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other. What is three in biblical numerics? You know that that's divine completeness. And Velo goes so far as to say it's proof when you hear the number three that God is in it. Okay? Then we go to verse 33. Three bowls made like unto almonds. And these are the, what are in each of the branches, by the way. Three bowls or cups made like unto almonds with a knob or the knob and a flower in each one or one branch or any meaning each branch. And three bowls make like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that came out of the candlestick. What are these almonds? Most of you know that the almond is symbolic, it, that the tree itself is the earliest to bloom. It's the earliest to produce fruit. So when you see the word almond, understand the symbology that we're talking about the first fruits. Verse 34. And in the candlestick, and this means actually better translated in the shaft of the candlestick, shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with our knops, with their knops and their flowers. So on each of the six branches on the outside, you have actually three ornaments or looking in the shape of a budding flower. On the center shaft, you have four of the identical. Verse 35. And there shall be a knob, or knob, under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. And what this is talking about is on the six branches that go on the outside, the two on the complete outside actually join the shaft at a different location than the next two inside. They join the shaft a little higher 
and then the other two join a little higher than that. So this is talking, there'll be one of these little spherically shaped knobs at the point on the shaft where each of these two join together. Verse 36, their knobs and their branches shall be of the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and what's seven? Spiritual completeness, right? And also the stamp of the covenant. And they, well, who are these they? Well, we'll find out in a little bit, it's the priests, shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Now the place assigned for the candlestick in the, what some people call the first apartment, actually it's, the, or you can also call it the holy place, which is immediately outside of the holy of holies, okay? So it's a little apartment or a room right outside the holy of holies. Uh, what this, they may give light over against it, it means that the position of the light was such that the light reflected more on to the, uh, the holy place, or actually toward the holy of holies, than toward one entering into the room. Verse 38, and the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. Now these tongs were snuffers. Each morning, we'll see here in a moment, the priests would uh, extinguish the lamp, and actually it was a little pincher-like thing, and then the little snuff dish was to take the ash, or the snuff, as they would call it, into a little dish for cleaning up the lamps. <clears throat> Excuse me. 39, of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. Uh, talent, uh, the measurements are interesting too. I don't know if you've ever done a study on measurements, but uh, there's, there are different weights. A talent of gold is different than a talent of silver. Uh, and different materials have different weights. Uh, I'm going to put this, that this candlestick weighed somewhere around 170 pounds. So it was a good sized candlestick. And it was probably, by other biblical accounts, approximately five feet tall. So a lot bigger than most menorahs that you would see. Verse 40, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. And in chapter 37, verse 17 of this book, Moses would accomplish the making of the candlestick just as God instructed. These lamps, what did they burn in those lamps? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 1 reads, <clears throat> And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure olive oil, oil olive, excuse me, beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. I want you to hold on to that they right there too. Who was responsible for supplying this oil? The congregation of Israel. They were responsible for bringing the oil. Okay, this pure olive oil too, by the way, was, and there are some historical accounts that actually the people brought the oil, it was prepared in this special way, making it the purest possible olive oil, and then they would actually even seal it in little bags and label it for later use, that it was authentic and, and capable of being used for burning in the lamp. Verse 3, without the veil of the testimony, that's the veil separating the Holy of Holies from the uh, holy place, in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning. So we see here that it was to burn through the night actually. They lit it in the evening and then, then in the morning extinguished it, cleaned up the lamps and refilled the oil. And I'll point out again the oil being brought by the congregation. Before the Lord continually it shall be a statute forever in your generations uh, some read that it was burning continually meant that it burned 24 hours a day. Uh, the way I break it back, it, it comes out though that it's more, it's to be perpetual in your generations. From generation to generation, you're to burn it through the night. Verse 4, he shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. Chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 12, and I turned, the I here being John, to see the voice that spake with me. And those with you with red letter edition Bibles know the voice that spoke with him was none other than Jesus Christ. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. 
Ooh, Revelation is so mysterious. I wonder if we will ever find out what these seven golden candlesticks are, are talking about here. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven, or in the middle of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Right in the middle of the seven candlesticks, Jesus Christ, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire the Shekinah glory that warms your heart because you love him and serve him. This description of the hairs uh, like as wool, white wool, you'll find an account of that in Daniel 7, 9 if you want to make a note for a side study. Verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass. Hmm, that rings a bell. Ezekiel chapter 1, the vehicle that brought the Godhead to earth had feet as brass, did it not? The pods, the landing pods. Verse 15, uh, we started that, as if they burned in a furnace. And you'll find in uh, Daniel 7, 9, it also says that his throne is a fiery flame. And his voice is the sound of many waters. What are the waters in Revelation? Chapter 17, 15, the waters are the people. He had the voice that many people could understand. Same voice that they spoke in Acts chapter 2. Okay, then verse uh, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Whoa, mysterious revelation. All this symbology. I don't know if we'll ever know what those seven candlesticks and these seven stars are. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, the truth. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When he is present, the sun, you can't even see it. He is so bright. That's the light of the world. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Boy, can you imagine what that would be like to have the Son of God lay his hand on your shoulder and say, Fear not. I hope after this message that you know you have nothing to fear. So, the first and the last, you know Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. His flesh was dead. He was crucified on the cross for our sins. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Keys of hell and death. He does have the keys of death. What happened when he was crucified on the cross and then became alive forevermore? You know. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. These instructions to John. And the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The past, present, and future. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. What is the menorah today? The seven candlesticks. Christianity, the seven churches. And remember we talked that man was responsible for providing the oil back in Leviticus. What happens when man is responsible for something? We fall short. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. I know you all are familiar with this scripture, but it fits so well with this message that I couldn't resist it. Of course, you all know in Matthew 24, uh, the disciples ask Christ, what will it be like at the time of your return? And he tells them the seven seals, the seven events that must transpire before he returns. And he continues actually in verse 25. So we're going to Matthew 25, verse 1. And you see the connection between chapter 24 and 25 by the way it starts. It starts, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins. For the sake of this message, let's call these the daughters of oil. And by the way, through this whole message, there is no gender implied whatsoever, okay? 
sons of oil, daughters of oil. I just please don't even think about gender, okay? Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. I'm probably throwing too much uh, biblical numerics at you, but 10 is the measure of responsibility and its judgment. So we've got the, the 10 virgins representing the churches of today, Christianity, and they're responsible for bringing their oil. Let's see what happens. They went forth to meet the bridegroom and they all thought they were ready. Let's see if they were. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Verse 3, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Uh-oh, what happens when you don't have oil to put in your lamp? Doesn't make a very bright light, does it? The Christians are supposed to be reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have your wick trimmed, and we'll get to that here in a minute, and oil in your reservoir, your light's not going to be shining very bright when the bridegroom returns. Verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Don't fall asleep. Watch. Verse 6, and at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. The seventh trump has just sounded. The bridegroom is returning. Verse 7, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Trimmed wicks burn brighter. So they are all getting ready for the bridegroom to see how their light has been reflecting his glory while he was gone. Verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Better translated, going out, because they didn't bring their reservoir of oil. Verse 9, And the oil, remember, symbolic of truth. 9, but the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. This is one oil you can't buy. This is one oil that you have to earn yourself through studying God's word and understanding his overall plan. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, being Christ, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgins, the five that ran short of oil, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Christ himself speaking. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How do you get into the kingdom of heaven? by doing the will of the Father. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, what day are we talking about? The Lord's day. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 25, and we'll pick it back up with verse 12. Christ himself speaking again. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Get out of my sight, I know you not. 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And that's true. Chapter 3 of Zechariah. It's the next to the last book in the Old Testament, by the way. And he showed me Joshua. Now some would teach, and I've heard it said, this is Joshua, just like Joshua in the book of the Bible. It's not. Hebrew, Yeshua. Besides that, this was written 407 to 410 B.C. Joshua, the book of the Bible, died at the age of 110 in about 1400 B.C. So... He was a thousand years gone when this was written. So the point is we are talking about Yeshua here. And this is prophecy that will as surely come to pass as Psalms 22 came to pass. Because it's written. Verse, and we're still there in Yeshua. The high priest. Who's the high priest? Melchizedek. Standing before the angel of the Lord. Anytime you read angel of the Lord, you can just say, just pretty much plug in the Lord there. Okay? And Satan, 
who? Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Better translated, accuse him. But you know, Satan has nothing to accuse Yeshua of. He's without blemish. He's perfect without spot. Who was he accusing? Us. That's who he was accusing. Job chapter 1. God asked Satan, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. Well, what did you think about my old boy Job down there? He's, he's a pretty sharp old guy, isn't he? Yeah, but if you take, around, take down that guard or that hedge of defense you've got around him and let me have him for a little while and see what happens, he can, he can accuse you, believe me. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, talking directly to old Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Uh-oh, I wonder where Satan will set up shop. He just told him, I've chosen Jerusalem. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And this brand plucked out of the fire, uh, many of you probably have got even a note in your uh, uh, center margin there that that relates to Amos chapter 4. What the brands plucked out of the fire represent are symbolic of, or the remnant. The, the, the people that will hold on and keep God's charge. He's reserved a few. What is about this Lord rebuke thee? Uh, you remember in Jude chapter 1, which there is only one chapter, verse 9, Michael is contending with Satan over the body of Moses. What did Michael say? The Lord rebuke thee. Don't mess with Satan. I've heard people say, I'm right with Shepherd's Chapel. Boy, I'll get in there and I'll kick old Satan in the teeth. You can't do it to him. You can hurt him by doing what this ministry does, by teaching God's word. But my point is, you personally, as far as having power against Satan, don't mess with him. Ezekiel chapter 28, we learn that God made Satan the full pattern, full of wisdom and beauty. He made him perfect. And you would think about going up against him? No, rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. Also in Ezekiel 28, by the way, Satan there is called the king of Tyre. What was Satan's downfall there? Pride. Satan was sentenced to death to burn up from within inside himself because of his pride. And Satan will use that same pride on you. That's one of his favorite M.O.'s. It really is one of his favorite M.O.'s. It's funny, when man does something good on his own at work, you know, you accomplish a good project and you get a pay raise and everything, and you say, just look what I did with my two hands. I did this myself. Satan will be right there whispering in your ear, you are the greatest. You're, oh, I'm so wonderful. <laughs> What happens next week when something goes wrong? They're on the horn to the Father. It's kind of like Apollo 13. He's saying, Houston, we got a problem. They're saying, God, we got a problem down here. I think if people would spend half as much time praying in thanks for the blessings that God has given them as they do in the hotline to him complaining about a problem or blaming him for something, you would see a lot more blessed people on this earth. You truly would. Rebe I, I think I'll be uh, starting out to do this, but I think it's important. I, a lot of people, and we're going to talk about olive oil a little bit here, okay? And a lot of you probably don't go very far from home without olive oil. But I think we have some people that aren't sure about it. They're a little bit afraid of it. They're afraid, you know, to approach it and, and from a spiritual standpoint for fear of offending the Father, maybe. So I want to talk about oil, and it's not oil that we're going to put in our lamps to burn. This is the oil that we use for anointing our homes, each other. And I want to go over that just a little bit. It's, there's not all that much to it, friends. It, pick up just an ordinary bottle of olive oil at your grocery store, okay? Most pharmacies carry a little two-ounce bottle, such as that, that you can buy, and 
it's good to have this because you can separate the olive oil that you purchased in the grocery store bottle and separate it for the use that you intended here. Because olive oil has a lot of uses. You can cook with it, it has medicinal purposes, but the point in having it in a separate bottle is that you can keep it for the use it was intended. Whenever I refill a bottle, I like to pray to the Father, tell him I'm using this oil in obedience to him, and asking him to bless the oil. Okay? Let's talk about anointing someone and I think it's very important here, too. I'm not giving you the green light to go buy olive oil and walk down the street and try and anoint everybody on the street that you see. There's one very important thing about using olive oil, and that is that the person requests the anointing. Absolutely necessary. It expresses the faith on their part that they believe that they're, and it's not the oil that has the power, that God has the power for the healing or removing the evil spirit or whatever. Okay, so, uh, evil spirits. As you heard Pastor Murray say often, there isn't one hiding behind every bush or every curtain. There are people that are possessed with evil spirits. Pastor Murray uh, asked me to be there with him as he was removing one of these spirits, so probably six weeks ago at the chapel. And I'll tell you one way that you can really tell whether that person has an evil spirit or not. Keep the oil out of sight until you're about to anoint them. Pull the oil out and you will actually see them back up away from it. You will see them lose the ability to stand. Uh, this old boy, he kind of, when Pastor Murray pulled out the oil, he went back, I don't like talking about this and I'm certainly not going to mention any names, but he went back up against the door and started slumping down. Just as about as he was about to hit the floor, there was a guy that had never been to the chapel before coming in the entryway. And we were already, everybody was in church, he was coming in late. So as Pastor Murray was helping him up by his bootstraps, as such, this guy from Dallas walks in and he looks over and sees that as Pastor Murray says a few words. And he looks over there at that and says, he turned around and looked back out like, oh, I, I wonder if I <laughs> ought to just head on back. And he just kind of grinned and went on into church. Okay, when you're anointing someone that is, 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 has an evil spirit, let's call it, you don't have to say anything fancy, okay? Take a small amount of the oil, place it on their forehead. I anoint thee in the name of Yeshua Messiah. I order any negative, you don't have to say out you devils, you know, da 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 da. Don't get the person all excited. Just simply say, I anoint thee and I order all negative away from you. Satan, keep your hands off this child of God. Build a fence around him to protect him in the name of Jesus Christ. That's all there is to it. When someone actually has an evil spirit and it's removed, there's a void there, a vacuum, I like to call it. And it's important that they fill that. And by the way, order those spirits back where they came from. I, that's one point I don't want to neglect. And that's exactly the way Christ did it, back where you came from. Okay, uh, there's a void there that has to be filled. So talk to the person, tell them, look, you're gonna, if you don't fill that void, it leaves an opening right for those spirits to come back. The word of God is the defense against that, okay? Uh, anointing for healing. Again, important, don't anoint unless the person requests it. That's an expression of faith on their part. And you simply anoint them with a small amount on the forehead, ask God for healing in the name of Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Okay, I may have over-exaggerated that or over-expressed it, but I just felt the need today. So we're going back to Zechariah, and we're going to pick it up with verse 3. Now Joshua, I'm just going to from here on read as it is in the Hebrew. Now Yeshua was, actually translated, had come to be clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Jesus in filthy garments? What are those garments filthy from? Our sins. Yours, mine, the sins of the world of those that take him as their savior. Verse 4, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. These that stood before him are the attending ministering angels. 
saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. This change of raiment is a uh, garments of royalty, or you might, we might think of it as a robe of righteousness. Verse 5, And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. In the, arm, in the gospel armor, what is that goes on the head? The helmet of salvation. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with the garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Now pay very close attention because this next verse, if you really read it and take it in English, it'll throw you. Verse 6, And the angel of the Lord, that's the Lord himself, protested unto Yeshua, saying, Check out that word protested in your Strong's Concordance. It means solemnly affirmed or testified. So the angel of the Lord didn't protest to Yeshua. He testified to him. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. This word keep in, in, in Hebrew is shamar, and it means to hedge about with thorns or guard or protect. And I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Verse 8, Hear now, O Yeshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows, oh, I wonder who these fellows are, that sit before thee, these are the elect, for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. The branch, of course, being Messiah. Uh, those of you, I think it's in the Companion Bible, it has a note on this, men wondered at are men uh, that serve as signs of greater to come, the elect. Verse 9, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Yeshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes, actually seven pairs of eyes, and these are symbolic of the 7,000 of Romans 11 that have eyes to see. Also the 7,000 that keep God's charge. Verse 9, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Yeshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof. He's going to write a name on that stone. It's the name that you'll find in Revelations chapter 2, which is actually not mentioned there, but those that overcome will have their name written on this stone. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, what day are we talking about? The Lord's day. Saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call, and this word call better translated to invite in or to invite under, everyone shall call invite in or under his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Every knee will bow on that day and it will be a day of plenty is what this is symbolic of. There will be plenty for all because Yeshua Messiah will be with us. Okay, chapter 4, what we came here for. I, I thought it important to cover this chapter 3 because it brings in the, the seven eyes so that you pick up the, the uh, that we're talking about the elect here, that 7,000. And we'll even hit it harder here in chapter 4. And the angel that talked with me came again, talking to Zechariah, and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And by the way, this is the fifth vision that Zechariah records in his book, in the book of Zechariah. And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top, this would be a receptacle for the oil, symbolic of truth, and his seven lamps, seven lamps are the 7,000 elect thereon, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. And those, again, with you with companion Bibles have a note that the seven pipes to the seven lamps looks forward to Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, which we'll go to in a moment. Verse 3, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Verse 4, so I, being Zechariah, answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? 
Now, Zechariah probably had seen a menorah, the seven candlesticks, at one point in his life before. I think what Zechariah was asking, what are these two olive trees standing beside the seven candlesticks? Verse 5, Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord, or no, sir. And the angel's not going to tell him real quickly either. He's going to interject another thought here. Verse 6, Then he, the angel, answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Hebrew, Zerubbabel, born in Babel, born in confusion. How do you come out of Babel? How do you come out of confusion? It tells us right here, the word of the Lord, the truth, brings people out of Babel. Saying, remember our oil too is truth, right? Unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, better translated, not by man's might, nor by power, power of the flesh, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This is not going to happen by the power of man in the flesh. It's going to happen by the spirit of the Lord of hosts. Verse 7, Who art thou, O great mountain? What's the mountain that's going to be set up in this age? Symbolic of a nation? One world system? Do you have the faith of a mustard seed? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. A uh, plain here, you will be leveled flat, if you would, would be a better translation. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. What's the headstone? Chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ. Verse 8, and there's a lot of grace there. Verse 8, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. And we're talking about the foundation of the many-membered bodies. Back in Haggai, we saw that Israel, after they came out of the captivity, rather than rebuilding the temple, what did they do? They started building themselves big, nice, fancy houses. Zerubbabel laid the foundation, and seven years later, finally, Haggai and the rest of them got together and decided, hey, we better get this temple done instead of sitting around here building some nice houses for ourselves. Okay, and we got to his hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the word of host hath sent me unto you. Verse 10, for who hath despised the day of small things? That question really sunk into me. That, there's a perfect truth found in that. And that perfect truth is this. Those that have great expectations, or you might say goals, in their life aren't upset by a day that they don't get but a little bit done because and what, what hit me about that is that it's important to have goals in your life because if you don't have goals you don't know really whether you got a lot done today or not do you if you don't have the goals to know where you're going what direction you're going but if you have goals or great expectations even if you have a bad day and didn't get as much as you would like to have done, you still took another step toward the right direction. Okay? I, I, I like that. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Who are those seven that are the eyes of the Lord and run to and fro on this earth. The elect. And as I think important too to point out, as Pastor Murray said this morning, people I think get hung up on 7,000. That How could that be possible? There's only 7,000. You know? And as Pastor said this morning, that's spiritual completeness. That's all it means. What number will it be? It'll be the number that God said, this is how many there are. And, and you know what? It will be exactly the number that stood by him in the first earth age. I mean, after all, who are they? Okay, verse 11. Then answered I and said unto them, this is Zechariah speaking again, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Zechariah's not giving up. He's still coming back to these two olive trees. 
Verse 12, And I answered, this is Zechariah again, and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? So we've got these two olive trees standing on each side of the candlestick, which represent the 7,000 elect, and the oil is flowing from them into the candlestick. Verse 13, And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? He's not giving no Zechariah any breaks here. And I said, No, my lord, or no, sir. Verse 14, Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This word anointed again in the Hebrew, Ben Yitzhar, sons of oil. These two sons of oil God's not going to trust man as the ten virgins were responsible for bringing the oil of truth for the lamps when the bridegroom returns. What happens when man does it? He falls short. Through these two anointed ones, they will be given oil to keep their lamps burning. That, that's to say the elect. This Lord of the whole earth, too, those with you companion Bibles, the Lord of the whole earth, that points toward Messiah because he will be the Lord of the whole earth, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Okay. You know who these two anointed ones are, I'm sure, by now, don't you? The two witnesses. And we're going to go to Revelation chapter 11. The idea for this message and... Uh, came from a question that someone asked the other day. And I think it was a younger girl that asked the question. The question was, Satan has the power to perform miracles, right? Yes, he will have the power to perform miracles. What say, what, what's the event that people look to happen just prior to the return of Christ? What's the last prophecy that must be fulfilled before our Lord and Savior returns to us? The two witnesses have to be killed in the street. The little girl was thinking, now wait a minute, if Satan can perform miracles, why couldn't he just create an illusion? We got these two guys here, they're dead. Messes everybody up, it wasn't the two witnesses. So the idea for this message came from the fact that he tells us how we know these two witnesses. And let's go to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to pick it up with verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. What is prophecy? I'm saying this a lot today, and I, need, I guess I need to hold down on it, but if you have a companion Bible, look at Appendix 189. Not right now, just make a note. Appendix 189 tells us that prophecy is the Word of God, is a gift of the Spirit. It is for comforting, exhorting, and testifying from Scripture to believers. That's what prophecy is. These two will have that power, and it will be truth that they're pumping into the elect at that time through the olive oil. A thousand two hundred and three score days, will that be shortened? Three and a half years was shortened. The reign of Antichrist probably will be shortened. I don't think it says anywhere. If, if somebody finds a place that it says, yeah, it will be shortened, I'd please write me in. But I don't believe it states anywhere. It only makes logical sense, though, that that would be the case. Verse 4, these, we're talking about the two witnesses, are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, standing beside God rather than falling for the lies of Antichrist. What are these two candlesticks? Boy, we've been talking about seven candlesticks. What happened to the other five? Candlesticks, Revelation chapter 1, are the churches. Smyrna, Philadelphia, right there. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. 
That's a lot of power. 2 Kings chapter 1, Ahaziah was on his deathbed. He sent to Beelzebub to inquire would he get well. Rather than asking of God, he had his men on the way to Beelzebub to inquire whether he would get well or not. What happened? Elijah met them on the way. He said, tell them everything's okay. You go back, you tell him that the God of Israel said he's going to be okay. They went back and the king got mad when he saw him coming back. He said, you go back out there and you get that man, Elijah, after they gave him a description. What happened then? Elijah was sitting up on a little hill and this man, 50, a captain of 50 and his 50, the captain of the 50 said, ye man of God, come down from there. The king wants to see you right now. If I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume you. The fire of God come down and consume you. Zap. They were gone. Send another 50. Ye man of God, come down from there. The king wants to talk with you. Zap. Another 50. Elijah? <laughs> Please let me find favor in your sight, you man of God. They will have power. They'll have power. Do you think, too, that the two witnesses with this kind of power to protect themselves, if they see the elect being abused, do you think they will put up with it for one minute? No way. You have nothing to fear. They're going to be right there tied into this seven candlesticks, pumping the oil of truth, keeping you going. I don't think there's a chance that one of you would turn the wrong way, but they're going to be right there. The 7,000 elect have already been judged. Is that right? They've already been judged. They stood with God. So would it be fair for God to give these 7,000 people the benefit of all this extra truth and everybody else is out here without the oil being pumped? No. Why did he do it? They've already been judged. Okay. Verse 6, <clears throat> excuse me, these have power, we're talking about the two witnesses still, to shut heaven. Who else had power to shut heaven? We just talked about him. Elijah shut the rain off. That it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters, remember Revelation 17, 15, the waters of the people, to turn them to blood. Now this is an interesting word in the Greek, blood. It's ha -e. You know what it especially means? The atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The two witnesses will have the power to turn the people to the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. What else can they do? They'll have the power to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Take your strongs and check out smite. It means fatal. Plagues means wound. Hmm. Am I saying the two witnesses are going to hit with the, the fatal wound? I know the truth of God's word will create the fatal wound. Will it be the two witnesses? I don't think anybody knows. They'll be right there though. Verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and yes, kill them. It will happen. It's prophecy. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, underlined spiritually, is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Our Lord wasn't crucified in Sodom or Egypt, was he? He was crucified in Jerusalem. Spiritually, why would God compare Jerusalem at this time to Sodom and Egypt? An abomination to him. What do you think it's going to be like after Antichrist has reigned there for this period of time? It will be an abomination to him. That's the reason it's going to be leveled, but it will be rebuilt. Okay, and oh, by the way, this word street, I mean, okay, we're seeing all this happen. Let's say uh, Satan was going to create an illusion, and we were watching CNN, and sure enough, there's two guys that land dead right in the street. 
It's important for you to take that word back to the Greek as well. It's plot i a, and it means a wide place or an open square. So if you see two guys laying in the streets of Jerusalem, rather than it being a wide open place or an arena, or you might call it, it's not the two witnesses, okay? It will happen just exactly the way it's written here. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, all the people of the world, saying, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Hmm. What else lasted three and a half days? Well, several things come to mind, but the most prominent one, the days that Christ was in, the number of days he was in the tomb. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. This word graves here is menema, and it means a tomb. You know, I can just see the two witnesses telling Antichrist, you go ahead and kill me, but I'm going to tell you something. In three and a half days, the Spirit of God will enter back into my body, and I will ascend back up to be with my Father. You know why they're leaving them out in the wide area and wouldn't let them be placed in a tomb? What do the opponents of Christianity say happened to Christ's body, actually? Somebody came and stole them in the night. So we're going to make sure. These two guys said in three and a half days, the Spirit of God is going to enter into them. We're going to watch. We're not going to let this happen again with somebody coming stealing their bodies away in the night. Okay, and verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another. It's going to be a big party, celebration, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. They tormented those that were on the wrong side. They didn't torment those that were on God's side. And they're going to be happy. I mean, boy, sometimes the truth hurts. You know what I mean? If, if you're doing wrong and you've got two prophets with all this power and people see this happening, you know, just like Elijah. Boy, can you imagine being around when old Elijah zapped those 50? I believe I'd have listened to whatever else he had to say. Okay, they're having a good time. But you know what? There's a reason for us to rejoice at that time as well. Think about it. Verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Can Satan create an illusion of the spirit of God entering into anything? You'll know who the two witnesses are, and you'll know if it's an illusion, friends. This word fear fell upon them. Uh, the Strong says it's pipto. If you take it all the way back to the, the text, it's epipipto, and it means a paralyzing fear fell upon them. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and we'll see when we finish here in a minute. This is not a rain cloud. And their enemies beheld them. You know, this is the closest thing that's going to happen to the rapture. This is it, folks. <laughs> this is all there is to the rapture right here. These two ascending. It is written. It will happen. So, we've got the seven candlesticks, symbolic of the elect. We've got these two olive trees, the two witnesses, standing on each side, just a pumping that old oil of truth right into the 7,000 elect. Now they've ascended to heaven. Where's the 7,000 going to get their oil when that happens? In conclusion, Acts chapter 1. And we're going to pick it up about verse 6. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they, the they here being the apostles, therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, and they were gathered together at the Mount of Olives. Christ had instructed them, you stay at Jerusalem until I come back to meet you. And they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? 
and this being the second advent. He'd already died on the cross, and he was back on earth at this point. And they're asking him, is this, are you going to establish your kingdom at this time? Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And this word seasons, by the way, in Greek is kahiros, and it means a set time. So I know you've often heard Pastor Murray say, it's not for us, it is not for us to know the exact time, but know the season. So if some people point to you and say, wait a minute, it says here you're not even supposed to know the seasons. Take it back to the Greek. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And in Samaria, that means watch station or watch mountain, and into the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As I said, the cloud that took the two witnesses up is not a rain cloud. It is a host of angels. Just as Pastor Murray this morning was saying, the host of angels that Elisha showed to his armor bearer, saying, hey, we're going to fight all these guys. We got the backing to do it. Verse 10, well, they saw the cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These two were angels. Check it out. I think there were the two witnesses. Verse 11, which also said, ye men of Galilee, now picture this, they're standing there, he's just ascended up, and they're standing there looking up in the sky, I'm sure thinking, well, I wonder when he's going to come back. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly, uh, we got that, verse 11, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. This so and in like ties it, locks it in, in the Greek. It means it will happen exactly like you saw it happen before. It will happen exactly where you saw it happen before. Where were they? Verse 12. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. What's that, Olivet? Mount of Olives, of course, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Let's go to the Father. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. Father, I hope that these people have enjoyed it. I'll be careful to always give you the praise, Father. We thank you for the two witnesses. I know that no one knows who they are, Father. But we ask that you give them strength. We know you will give us strength through this trying time, Father. If we have the truth of your word, we don't have the need for anything else. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.